uh, this is a newsletter uh, from uh, the Bruno Mill. They're coming home this summer. They're going to be here for a short uh, visit. Hopefully, I have a child arranged for them to come on Wednesday night. I emailed them and asked if he was available on Sunday, but he's not. So I'm going to see if there's a Wednesday that he's free to come and share with us about the work that's been carrying on in Rome. They've been here over 25 years. They planted uh, him and his wife together with the Lord's blessing. They have planted two churches in the city of Rome. And, and as we, uh, through these newsletters, we kind of keep apprised of how the work is going there. And uh, just as we can get newsletters from the eyes of readers and from the breweries and, and from others that uh, and, and work holders who's here in, in the, down in the London area to transport for Christ. So we know a few of them, so we need to continue to remember those that are serving. Fashion. I invite you to turn your Bible to Titus. The next slide, uh, we're going to stay here for a second. This morning, we're going to talk about marks of a healthy church, thoughts from the book of Titus. But go to the next slide. Uh, you'll see a picture of the island of, well, you'll see at the bottom, a picture of the island of Crete. And then you see in the immediate area with all those islands, that's Greece. I guess it's easy to hide and not pay your taxes from many of those islands, which is one of the problems with Greece. But here we are, Greece, 2,000 years ago, on the island of Crete, uh, Paul left Titus. A church had been planted there by Paul. Uh, it took a, a got there by ship, obviously. And Titus was a Greek convert of Paul's and a trusted fellow worker. And so Paul leaves him behind to establish the church and particularly to organize the church on Crete. This is written, this letter is written, though in our Bible we have 1 and 2 Timothy and then Titus, actually that's not in chronological order at all. If you could uh, take the page out and stick it in between 1 and 2 Timothy, that would be chronological. In 1 Timothy, Paul's in jail in the road, and under house arrest, and he's writing a letter to the church. And then in Titus, he's free, he's, he's been released, and there's a, a small window, maybe a year or so, where Paul is free again. And then in 2 Timothy, Paul is once again in jail, that time un under the thumb of Nero. And that was his final time in jail, because ultimately Paul was executed and many thousands of Christians were killed in the Colosseum of Rome and throughout the Roman Empire. And so this little letter is actually a time when Paul is, is, is not in prison and he's writing to Titus. The day is between 62 to 64 AD. Crete, that island down there, had a terrible reputation. If you, you know, one of the things we were reading at the table this week, and, and it sounds very harsh, and, and you wonder, well, isn't this a little bit uh, extreme to say of someone? Paul, speaking of the Cretans, said, and he's quoting from one of their own prophets in verse 12, he said, even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. And then he follows up by saying, this testimony is true. And so he's quoting what some folks said about the Cretans. He doesn't deny it or refute it. He actually says, you know, culturally speaking, that pretty much sums up what the populace of Crete is kind of like as a whole. He doesn't say everyone. It's sort of a cultural generalization. We realize that uh, there are some generalizations that have a greater truth to them. And just so you don't think that Paul is being uh, overly harsh, consider what these two ancient historians said. Polybius, he lived from 200 to 118 BC, he said of Crete, he said, it is impossible to find personal conduct more treacherous or public policy more unjust than in Crete. That's not a great thing to have as your your reputation as a, as a, as a country. Uh, furthermore, Cicero, who lived from 106 to 43 BC, said of the Cretans, moral principles are so divergent that Cretans consider highway robbery honorable. So when Paul says, uh, even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons, and then goes on to say, that's pretty much true. That's sort of a description of this is the place where Paul left Titus to shepherd the church. Now, one of the exciting things about that is, is who is the gospel of Christ for? Everyone. That's right. Jesus came to save sinners. 
And so when we think about this situation here, this is, this is where the church is supposed to be, in the middle of it, seeking to present Christ to people who are needy and who are under the judgment of God because of their sins, and yet presenting to them hope and salvation in the way of Jesus Christ. And so this is, and yet you can imagine some of the culture, some of the challenges when people became Christians and then they, they were coming to church and learning to follow Jesus. You can imagine every day was a struggle to be a Christian because here's my old way of life and here's the way of life to which Jesus is calling me. And you know, you know the situation is no different today, isn't it? As we look at our culture and we think about when a person comes to Christ and all the values and worldview that they have hold. And then how our worldview is to be transformed by the renewing of God's word. And so we, we can identify a bit with the previous. The other thing is we think about the purpose of, of this letter. As I mentioned, Paul sent Titus there to organize the church, to appoint elders in every town. He also had the job of silencing the voices of the false teachers that were there. Uh, one of the jobs of church leaders is to guard the gate. That's one of the duties of the deacons, the elders of the church, is to guard the gate against those who would hurt or divide or stir up trouble in the church. And Paul explicitly says this to Titus, you must silence those who are speaking contrary to the gospel of Christ. Uh, thirdly, he used to teach, uh, Paul left it times there, very strictly saying in chapter 2 about teaching and the emphasis on sound doctrine and then encouraging good works. And we're going to review some of those as we think about the marks of a healthy church are. But before we do that, the next slide, I have a neat verse that I want to point out to you. In chapter 2, verse 11 to 14, we have one of the clearest statements in the scriptures as it regards to statement about the deity of Jesus Christ. There's lots of references to Jesus being God in the New Testament, but none quite so worded uh, as it is in Titus chapter 2. So you might want to underline it in your Bible. It's beginning in verse 11 to 14, so we can get the context. I'm uh, mentioning a, a clear statement as it regards the deity of Christ. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all, all men, all women, and it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself the people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And yet right in there, and it's almost too easy to run right over, but the, the statement, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and so if you're wondering about, you know, when someone says, well, where does it say that Jesus is God? Well, this is a, this is a one verse, right, in, in the book of Titus, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, because sometimes people will argue with you and they say, Lord, well, it says Lord, it just means you're calling him Sir. Some people will make that erroneous argument at times. Well, take them to Titus chapter 2, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ as an explicit statement of the deity of Jesus. So that's just a little bit of an introduction. Uh, but now let's move forward and talk, as I mentioned at the introduction, marks of a healthy church. When it comes to health, uh, when people apply and think about different criteria, some will talk about one's financial health, their physical health, your heart health, your dental health, how well your relationships with others are, state of your mental health, and, and very rarely do folks outside of the church talk about a person's spiritual health. You know, it's, um, I was at a, did some training with the fire the other day on um, helping people in crisis, and they talked about the different aspects of what it means to be a person and, and to address, and thankfully in this, they didn't just skim over the aspect of a person's spiritual health, they actually tried to the teacher, who was actually a Christian, tried to engage the, the rest of us in thinking about how pe what people bring to the table in terms of their faith, their religious beliefs in a time of crisis. It stirred up a little bit of trouble in the, in the lesson, and yet so often people just give lip service to, well, you know, there's your, in terms of your health, there's your spiritual health, but then in the, in the, like three seconds later they move on to something else because they're terribly uncomfortable to talk about that aspect of a person. 
And yet, as you and I, as a follower of Christ, we realize that our walk with God, nothing is more important than our walk with God. Uh, our physical health is going to fail. We don't want our walk with God to fail. And that's the most vital thing about us. And so, and it, so we need, but we need to talk about as a church, what makes for a healthy church? Well, the first point is, there's four of them. If you look at chapter one, and this is where I ask you guys, we didn't have our scripture reading this morning because I, I knew I was going to get you to dig in, into the types a little bit. First point is, is, for a church to be healthy, it has to have godly leaders, people who are committed to holiness, who are leading the church. If you don't have a church where your pastor, where your deacons are actively pursuing after God, your church is going to be sick. This is... And so, one of the and one of the ramifications of that is I recognize in saying that is is I, I feel that burden and I know that Brian Dorf and Laura and Gloria feel that feel that there's an expectation that as ones who are in a position in the church uh, that in order for the church to be healthy we have to be spiritually healthy, which also brings the rest of us in is that we need your prayers and not just general prayers like help help uh, Ryan Dorf or help Todd, or help Gloria, or help Lori, but they, you and I, uh, as we're facing the same struggles that everyone faces, that you would pray that we would be uh, honest in our dealings, that we would be sexually pure, that we would have the right attitude and service, all the same, very same things that you would pray about yourself, but that you would specifically commit to praying for the leaders in your church, because knowing that for a church to be healthy, it has to have godly leaders. And so how to participate in that as a congregation is we encourage one another, we pray for one another. So I, I ask you for that. But here, look at the passage. Paul says to Titus, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And then he gives the qualifications for someone who is in the position of an elder. An elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild or disobedient. And since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless. That doesn't mean perfect. You're not going to find a perfect pastor or perfect deacon. Uh, he must be blameless, not overbearing, uh, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, they must be hospitable. And one who loves what is good and who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined, holding firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. And then immediately, he goes into verse 10 and says, there's many people, mere talkers. Those are the ones who are supposed to be silencing. So he moves forward to talk about the problem that was in the church of people that had infiltrated it or leading her astray. But first, there is this establishment. If you want your church to be healthy, you have to have, you need to put in charge in, in these towns, he says to Titus, you need to put people who, who fit this criteria. And he provides it for him. He doesn't just say, go get some good people. He says, this is the qualifications of people that you're looking for. And don't shortcut that process. Don't put someone into a position who maybe has potential, because everyone has potential. Put people in the place who are demonstrating these qualities. They're not going to be perfect, obviously. But you want to put people who have a desire to be godly, who are striving after holiness, who have demonstrated some of these things. Because if, you're, if you want your church to be healthy, you have to have this. And with that said, again, I meant to ask you, to pray for your pastor and to pray for your leaders of the church. The second uh, mark of a healthy church is that healthy churches are churches where the word of God is taught faithfully. Have a look at verse 9 of uh, which we just read a moment ago, but have again a look at verse 9 of chapter 1. It says, He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can refute so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. There's a dual thing there, isn't there? One, at the very core of it is, you, for a church to be healthy, there has to be the faithful teaching of God's Word. This is the Word of God. It's not a myth. 
not just made up stories. This is this this is God's word. It's true. And here's how here's who God is, and here's how we're supposed to live. That's one of the parts of church is you come, you expect that you would hear the word of God expounded, that the, that the scriptures would would hold a central place in the gathering of the church. That's what Paul says. The scriptures must be expounded. You must teach people. Teaching of doctrine. Now some people are like, well, doctrine is boring. Well, it might sound like a boring term, but it's very important that we have think right thoughts about who God is and properly understand the work of Christ and, what, and whatever other subject that the scriptures address that you and I, we wrestle with it and we come to, our mind would come into agreement with what scriptures are teaching. And so there's a, it's vital that we're in the Word of God. So Paul says, you have a job to do, and it is to teach, 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 teach. That's part of your job, Titus. And then also uh, connected with that is, is when there are, are dissenting voices, you are not to give them the platform. You are to silence them. Um, you know, we, sometimes we want to be nice, and so... We, we well, in our niceness, we let people say, sometimes we'll let people say a whole bunch of false things about God. But in a church, that's not supposed to happen. Not to say that we can't have debate or conversation about what does a passage mean, but at the end of the day, the church has to guard the gate against false teaching. And the primacy of the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God. All Scripture, you know, that passage we looked at last week and 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man and woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so healthy churches are teaching centers where the word of God is faithfully and carefully expanded. Now, just as a side note, uh, I'm hoping that you never get tired of hearing the gospel. I'm hoping you never get tired of hearing the word of God expounded. And if you think that I'm getting boring, just pray for me. <laughs> How about that? Pray for me and pray for the working of the Holy Spirit in your heart, in my heart. But as a church, we must never, ever tire of hearing the word of God. Um, it is to shape it, it's to shape our worldview, how we look at the world and how we interact with it. And we cannot ignore it. Neither can, not, can we ignore it in the, in the church itself, but don't ignore it in your day-to-day -day life either. Because there's only so much food I can shove in on a Sunday. <laughs> right? This is not like the buffet for the entire week where you're going to go on a diet for the rest of the week from God's Word. Uh, this is, you, can, you know what you need to do. Day-to-day, -day, you need to eat a little day to day you need to take in God's word a bit so that we can be strengthened in our walk with God. The third thing about a healthy church is it has members who are committed to personal holiness. So some of you want your pastors and your deacons and your leaders of the church who are committed to personal holiness and asking, asking praying for them so they would be found faithful. But also as for a church to be healthy it's, that it, it applies to the entire whole. Members who are equally passionate about following God and pursuing after holiness. You know, the Bible tells us, God says, be holy as I am holy. And, and, and then Paul, Titus, he gives uh, ex examples of what holiness looks like. If you look in chapter 2, back to the teaching thing, um, Paul says to Titus, he says in verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. And then, just to show you that doctrine is practical, Paul expounds to Timothy what Titus is to teach. He begins by, he talks about teaching uh, older men, older women, uh, younger men, uh, teaching slaves, that was the reality of life. Sometimes we blanch, especially in our culture because of the terrible history uh, of slavery. Uh, but the Bible, it, it addresses the subject. It always encourages people to gain their freedom. And, and, it talks, and the Bible, uh, the, the ideal of the scriptures is that people would live in freedom. And yet the reality was in the Roman Empire that perhaps in some places 70% of the population were slaves. And so Paul gives direction about if you're in that particular spot in your life, uh, how are you supposed to live? And so Paul gives even instructions about that. Uh, but but I want to think that I found that's kind of neat was he talks about teaching older men and so personal holiness, holiness is a practical thing. 
It's not just, I'm going to be holy. Paul then says, this is how you're supposed to be holy. This is, the, this is what it means to live out God's word in your life. And so he talks about the older men being temperate and worthy of respect and self-control. And uh, my mind is, I find it very fascinating. It, because he's talking to a man, he's, he's, he has Titus give direct instruction to the older men. He has Titus give direct instruction to the older women. But then there's a, some neat little flip that happens in that, in verses 3 to 5. The instruction is for the older women to teach the younger women. And so Paul doesn't say, Titus, you go talk to the younger women about how to, how to be good wives or how to be mothers. He actually says, teach the older women. And but also your and part of that instruction is the older women now have a responsibility is to, is to teach the younger women what it means to be a wife, what it means to be a mother, and how to conduct yourself. And so there's that all of us are involved in teaching. And that's so true, you know. Um, I was talking to a lady uh, during Emily's uh, orientation for school next year, and she's not a believer, but it just shows you the, the value of handing down good counsel generationally. And she was talking, we were talking about marriage, and she was talking about her husband, and she says, you know, she says, one of the things that my mother told me that blew me away was that some days your father's not everything that you think he is. <laughs> right? <laughs> And how she was saying, you know, someday they'll look at your father and they're not very impressed with what I see. And she goes, when you go into marriage, you need to understand that you're going to feel that way sometimes. And so not just not to press the bail button because you're, you're not feeling it that day. But she says, you know, that helped me so much in my relationship. Because I didn't go in with this, this idea that marriage was going to be perfect every single day of my life. And so there's an example where a mother taught a daughter something very important about how to maintain a relationship. How much more so as the followers of Christ passing on the truths of God's word about how to live properly and how to please God. And so we have responsibilities as fathers to sons, mothers to daughters, and, and we pass it along as believers. Where, but where do we start? We start with the word of God, which is true. And how to discern right from wrong, and, and, and having a heart that says, you know what, saying no to ungodliness. That's got to be in us, isn't it? Paul says in, in chapter 2, verse 11, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people, teaching us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And then Paul provides, as he always, this is my great sort of revelation this year as I read the letters of Paul. Paul tells us a lot about what to do, doesn't he? He's always telling us what to do. But never before had I realized that Paul always gives the motivation for why we should do what we do. And almost every Pauline letter, Paul always references it back to the mercy and grace of Christ and the forgiveness that we have in Jesus. And he's always taking us back there and saying, this is how you should live, and this is why you should do it. It's always in view of the mercy and the grace of Christ and the, and, and, and the fact that you've been rescued from the judgment to come forgiven of your sins. That's why you should seek to live a holy life. And then lastly, and then we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Number four, what does a healthy church have people who are eager, ready, and devoted to doing what's good? Those are the phrases that come out of Titus. Eight times in Titus, Paul uses the word good. Uh, for example, he says in Titus 1.8, an elder must be a person who loves what's good. Uh, he, he says in chapter 2 that the older women should teach the younger women what is good. He says in Titus 2 verse 7, Paul, Titus is to set a good example to the young men. Titus chapter 2 verse 14, he says, we need to be people who are eager to do what's good. In verse, chapter 3 verse 1, uh, be ready to do whatever is good. Chapter 3 verse 8, be careful to devote yourself to doing what is good. And then in chapter 14, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order that they may provide for the daily necessities of life and not live unproductive lives. And again, drawing back on what was the culture of Crete and what is the, trend, what is the goal of the transforming work of Christ in a person's life. And so, what is meant by good? The word that is there is whatever is beautiful or admirable, what's praiseworthy, what's noble, 
uh, what is morally good and honorable, what is commendable, what is excellent, what is upright. Those are all things that describe what Paul is talking about when he says, eager to do what is good, careful to do what is good, devoted to doing what is good. And so the, the question for us is, is that in our week to come, what are we supposed to be about doing as Christians? Doing good. How do I know what's good? Don't listen to the TV to figure out what's good. Right? Where do you go to find out what's good? What's this one? This is the Bible. This is where you, this is where you go to find out what is good and what pleases God. And then as a, as a great verse to close, as we think about Mark's in a healthy church, is let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who belong to the family of believers. That's the call of God, is be faithful in doing it. If you do, there will be a harvest for you. And, and, but always keep your eye out looking for what can I do to serve another person? Whether it's your spouse, your children, your neighbors, your people in your church, and your co-workers. Wherever you go, what can I do to serve someone else? That Christ might be seen in the way I live my life. And winning an opportunity, making the making by our lives the gospel of Christ attractive to people, that we can talk to them more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Stephen, would you come and lead us as we prepare for communion this morning? We're going to sing a song, uh, draw me close to you, and then we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So I'll have a Lori and Ryan if you can come, come up. Oh, we might as well stand together. Hey, Lori, right here. Sweet.